Good evening and welcome back after a bit of a break for a number of weeks um, for the, the holidays and me traveling overseas, but it's, it's, it's wonderful, even though we're not seeing each other face to face. It's, it's good to be uh, together again uh, around this virtual forum. Um, I uh, want to speak about today's date, which is the 10th of Shvat, significant uh, date. Um, as uh, as it marks two very closely connected, linked um, events uh, that uh, took place on, on this day, uh, sunrise and sunset in the Hebrew, Uva Hashemesh v'Zara Hashemesh. Um, and it's, it's an expression that's used uh, to signify that there's never a vacuum in leadership and that when we lose one leader, immediately another leader for a generation rises up. Um, and so the, the 10th of Tevet actually marks uh, the Yotzeit of the uh, previous Chabad Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzhak Schneerson. I have the privilege of being named after him. I was born a few years uh, after his, uh, his passing. Uh, he died in 1950, 10th of Tevet. Um, and uh, that was after 30 years of leadership of the Chabad movement. Um, and this was difficult times in 1950. I don't have to tell you, you know, it was a uh, post Holocaust, uh, and the vacuum and the pain uh, was tremendous in terms of the leadership of, of the Chabad movement. Um, of course, um, the Rebbe has a son in law. Um, but the same surname, Menachem and Loshneisen. In fact, uh, you, you may have noticed this picture that hangs uh, on, 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 in my study uh, on many occasions. See if I can catch it on the wall there. So if you can see the uh, the, the picture behind me, uh, just above my shoulder there, uh, that's that's that picture which uh, I have uh, in the study. And it became uh, fairly uh, obvious uh, very early on. Um, that uh, the Rebbe son-in-law was the uh, appointed uh, successor, uh, the person most worthy uh, of, of taking over uh, the leadership. Um, but it took a full year until uh, the Rebbe, Rebbe Nachman Doshneyesen, actually formally um, accepted the leadership of, of the movement. And here's a picture of the Rebbe, uh, early 50s, so around that time, as a young man. Um, and uh, he formally uh, took on the leadership of the movement of Lubavitch on the first year site of his predecessor, his father-in-law, um, at a gathering, at a Fabrenga, a gathering of Hasidim, where he um, delivered a Hasidic discourse uh, called a mimer, and I'll come back to that in a moment, um, and that uh, kind of officially um, marked the, his ascent to the throne, so to speak, or his formal acceptance. Um, here is a, a more a recent picture um, of the Rebbe, um, a beautiful um, smile uh, in this picture, and he led uh, about movement uh, from 1950, 51 officially, 1950 um, unofficially. Now, um, I put the words of this medrash on the screen because uh, it's important to go through a little bit of the history of this. Um, and, and we understand the history of this. We also understand a little bit of our own kind of national history um, as well. So we're going to kind of do this on a historical basis, but on a number of levels. Um, so there's a, a verse in Shir Hashir, that song of songs, that reads, I have come to my garden, and, and we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, when um, the previous Rebbe, towards the end of his life, um, was not... Um, really able to speak and to address uh, large crowds because of his failing health. Um, but he did publish Hasidic discourses. And the last discourse that he published, um, and this is on the occasion of 10th of Shvat, which happened to be um, a Yotzat, but not his yet, he was alive, um, but that of the grandmother. Uh, and and he, he published 
a Hasidic discourse which was to be given out, to be studied, to be learned by the uh, Hasidim um, on, on that day, 10th of Shvat Gushtet, you happen to be um, a, a Shabbos. Uh, and so on the occasion of that day, uh, the 10th of Shvat, uh, the Rebbe published um, that uh, uh, discourse. And um, it, it's, it's significant um, that a, a year later, when our Rebbe um, took over uh, the leadership, he formally also delivered a Hasidic discourse based on that same verse. Um, so let me um, just, let's go back to that verse in, in the Medrash, sorry, that verse in Sher Shem, and read um, a Medrash on it. Um, so in uh, Song of Songs, Sher Shem, you may be familiar, it's, it's the relationship between Hashem and the Jewish people depicted as a love story. And, and at one point, uh, the protagonist, who is Hashem in the story, says, I've come to my garden, Bati Legani. Come to my garden. So the Medrash on that verse says the following. It's Rabbi Nachem, son-in-law of Rabbi Eliezer, who says in the name of Shimon, it doesn't say to a garden. God doesn't have come to a garden. It says my God, my original God, the place where my main dwelling was originally. And the Medrash elaborates that upon creation of the world, God was found in this world. God of Eden, Gan Eden. But then the way man behaved, the way humans behaved, kind of made God ascend, leave this world and go up into divine realms, heavenly realms, what we call the seven heavens, levels that are not the physical world as we know it, but that are above. Uh, and so in a succession of, of seven stages, Hashem's presence, the Shekhinah, leaves this world in the sense, of course, the very first sin um, that was Adam in the Garden of Eden um, was the most crucial and the most damaging uh, because that made God leave this world. Hashem leaves this world, of course, not totally, leaving a remnant of his presence, uh, but he's no longer in his home. Uh, he leaves this world and, and goes up to uh, heaven number uh, one. Uh, not long thereafter, um, we have uh, the sin of, of Cain and Abel, and the Medrash says that causes Hashem's presence to lift one more level from first, the uh, lowest, the heaven, to the higher level. Uh, this is followed by the generation of Enosh, and this is when we read in Rashi, in the Midrashim, idolatry came into the world. It began to be denial of Hashem's presence. Oh, surprise, surprise, he's now, he's already in second heaven, uh, and through the behavior of humans around the time of Enosh, um, we have Hashem receding further up into the third heaven. Uh, thereafter came the generation of the flood. Of course, that was a very corrupt an immoral generation, so the humankind, mankind is degenerating. With each of these, uh, it becomes more difficult for the presence of Hashem to be felt, and so it kind of you know, leaves higher and higher. Um, there was a the generation of the tower. The generation of the tower is, of course, Migdal Bavel, the Tower of Bavel, um, and that was an extremely um, damaging event in terms of you know, people's relationship with God, um, the, the, the rebellion against their faith in Hashem and so forth, and God leaves even further. Um, we have the people of Sodom, a totally corrupt, depraved uh, society, um, and with their behavior, we have Hashem's presence leaving the world, going up one more stage um, uh, to sixth heaven, and then finally, um, the Egyptians in the days of Abraham, um, with their behavior, cause for uh, the Shekhinah or the dwelling of Hashem in this world to, to leave uh, and to now recede all the way to the seventh heaven. Now, when we say uh, we're in seventh heaven, that is usually an expression of something extremely positive, uh, but to say Hashem has left this world to first, second, third, and now he's up in, in, in that seventh level, uh, that is not a good thing. It's not a good thing for the world. Uh, and that's a process that has to be reversed. So there's a reversal. And we start bringing Hashem back into this world. And this will 
just like the departure, the ascent of godliness took seven stages, uh, it'll take seven uh, stages, seven generations. Uh, the first person to really actively work at bringing Hashem's presence into the world by declaring uh, the faith in God, by um, by by um, you know, spreading the word of God, by, by preaching and, and encouraging people to adopt belief in monotheism, Avraham Avinu, um, and then one generation down we have Yitzchak, uh, that takes us to Yaakov, um, then Levi, then Kahat. Kahat was the father of Amram, um, and by now you've worked out that number seven is none other than Moshe Rabbeinu. Uh, and Moshe Rabbeinu, as Moses do, what is Moses? Is Moshe's main achievement. Moshe builds a Mishkan, and in building the Mishkan, creates a place where the divine is now in the world again. So Moshe reverses this process, not only because Moshe was the agent for Matan Torah when God came down on Mount Sinai. Um, that wasn't as significant to the extent that what, whatever Moshe did at Mount Sinai, whatever Hashem did at Mount Sinai, well, it, it's gone. You know, there's no remnant. Uh, you can't go to Sinai and still um, experience uh, that, 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 that sanctity um, that, that was there when the shofar was blown at the end of the um, Sana experience uh, that that was uh, that was the end uh, of, of 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 that uh, revelation. It was a temporary revelation uh, that had to be followed and was followed by the Jewish people creating a literal dwelling for Hashem in this world. So Moshe is responsible with his generation, of course, but he's the leader. He's responsible for bringing God back into the world, and that's I have come to my garden to the place where I was earlier, I was previously, it was a long time before, um, uh, but Hashem says, I've come back, I've come home, I've come back into my garden, this world is Hashem's garden, and we've made a dwelling place for Hashem by building a sanctuary, a mishkan, and God can now be in the world once again. So that is the Medrash. The discourse that the previous Rebbe um, delivered was based on this uh, verse um, as well as on that concept of the Medrash with the generations that pushed God away and then the seven generations that brought Hashem um, back down here um, again. And uh, the point is made in the Medrash. It's also a quote, Kol Hashvi'in Chavivin, or sevenths are particularly precious, which is a quote uh, that comes up um, in that discourse. With that kind of was of, of the previous Rebbe's final spiritual um, last will and testament to his chassidim, uh, to his followers, um, in terms of, you know, that concept of the seven generations and aspects of which he develops in a, a lengthy series of, of, of 20 chapters long. Five chapters were meant to be published on, on his yard set. There were three days later uh, was a, a second installment uh, and there were two further installments that came out, um, had been already uh, pre uh, you know, published and approved and, and, and came out uh, in, in the weeks uh, that followed, creating a, a very involved 20 chapter um, discussion essay on this concept of the Shekhinah divine presence being found here in this world. Now, let's elaborate on this because that's historically very, very important and it helps us understand what this world's really all about and, and why we're here and why God even, God even made this world. And, and let me put back to you for you on the screen. Um, uh, an, another medrash, um, what have I done here? Press the wrong button, but this should work. Um, and uh, this is a medrash Tanchuma. Medrash Tanchuma is also quoting the same words, I've come to my garden. Um, he says, Rabbi Shmuel Ben Nachman said, when the Holy One blessed be, he created the world, 
He longed to have an abode below. He longed to have an abode below. Now, let's try to understand what that means. And Hasidic philosophy actually takes that medrash and, and creates a cornerstone um, of, 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 of the philosophy by saying the entire purpose of the creation of this world is that God wants to have a dwelling in this world world below. Conventional wisdom would say heaven's greater than earth. I mean, obviously, you know, where is there more sanctity? The higher you go into spiritual realms, the more godliness there is, and therefore that must be a better place, a more important place, a holier place, a more divine place. But Hasidic philosophy turns that around on its head completely by pointing out there's actually no big deal, even though those worlds above the spiritual worlds have amazing names, and if you study you know, Kabbalah, Hasidut, you learn about Atzilut, and you learn about Bria, Yetzira, Asiya, and all the various worlds, we learn about Or and Sof, Adam Kadmon, amazing and the divine revelations, emanations, but they're all levels of revelations and emanations. It's not God himself. So in fact, as far as divinity is concerned, even spiritual worlds are a diminishing or a contraction of godliness. And God contracted himself in uh, successive stages in order to eventually be able to create this world, not to get from God, who is infinite, to this world that is kind of really very, very, very finite, where it takes a, a lot of contraction of godliness until you can, you know, you can, you can bring it down to that level. Um, is contraction of godliness a good thing? Well, objectively speaking, it isn't. It's less godliness. Until we get to this world, this world is not less godliness. This world is not a world that is less holy than, than spiritual worlds. It is a world that is a totally new reality. It's a world of denial. It's a world in which Hashem has diminished, diminished himself so much that it's possible to deny his very existence. It's a world where atheists live thrive and prosper. And uh, it's very difficult to argue with them because look around, look around. You don't see God. Ah, yeah, you can study, you can learn, you can dwell, you can meditate, you can come to the realization if you want to, if you're open to that. There's a God in the world, but the reality of the world almost shouts out, there is no God in the world. So, what Hashem did by creating this world below is create a place that is so alien to him that it's possible to, to not experience him at all. Uh, and if you choose to do so, to deny his existence completely. When godliness is revealed here, and that's really something, to reveal godliness in the world is really divine, that's really godly, and there are such you know, heavenly realms above, big deal. But to reveal godliness in a world that is totally alien to Hashem, where Hashem created a world that has this, this illusion of absence, um, now that is an accomplishment when you're able to reverse that illusion and you're able to reveal godliness here. And so... Surprise, surprise, as generations move further away from Genesis, and already the generations that was connected to, to Genesis, the creation of the world, Adam Arishon already struggled um, with the presence of Hashem. I heard your voice in the God, and I hid, for I was afraid. Um, there's already this absence of Hashem in, in that, you know, Generation zero, and as we progress, that we, by our behavior, are kind of denying and denying and denying, and Hashem is removing Himself. And it takes the Herculean efforts of 
Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, and so forth, to bring down that Shechem Rebam here in this world, until finally Moshe Rabbeinu builds a Mishkan, symbolic of the fact that God's come back to his garden, that he's, that he's home again. That's an accomplishment. And that Mishkan isn't built only uh, in a structure. Of course, there was the Mishkan in, in the desert, um, and then the Mishkan traveled and was built in Jerusalem, Shiloh, Jerusalem, and eventually became a Beit HaMikdash, but that physical structure doesn't, doesn't exist anymore. Um, but the concept of Shechin in this world, um, and, and, and as many commentaries point out, when God said, build me a sanctuary, and I will dwell within it, the actual correct grammar is not betocho, I will dwell within it, but betocham, within them, it's about God dwelling within and through each of us in this world. And so whether we bring God because we become personal vessels to Hashem, or we build mini sanctuaries and we make shuls, or we create situations in our homes, we create sanctuaries for Hashem, that, that's, that's all possible now because we got the Torah and Moshe built the Mishkan and he made this world hospitable to Hashem. He made the world receptive to godliness. Essentially has everything, anything changed? Well, everything hasn't changed yet. Although more, pe more people recognize the greatness of Hashem, um, but there's still a lot of denial out there. And the world itself doesn't shout God. The world itself is still a world um, where there's this reality, this illusion of lack of um, godliness. It's our task, each one of us, to change that world. And um, the last seven generations have been an intensive process. When will the world properly change? It's ready, um, but it's not visible. We've been working for, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of generations to change this world from a place alien to Hashem to a place open to Hashem. And if I may borrow the analogy um, from this week's Pasha, Rashalach, the splitting of the sea. What happens when the sea splits? Suddenly you see, looking down, a new reality. It's always been there. The seabed's always been there. In fact, uh, you know, you study science, and you discover that in the sea, there is, uh, there, there's, there's as much life, uh, fauna and flora, and, 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 and mountain ranges, and formations, and who knows what, and volcanoes. There's more activity down there than there is on, on dry land. Um, but we're totally unaware of it all because the sea covers the seabed, and so we cannot see it. But with Kriyat Yamsuf, there was this opening, and suddenly there was a glimpse into a reality which exists, but it wasn't visible, and that is a metaphor for the coming of Mashiach, when suddenly a reality that exists in this world but is completely hidden from us, is going to appear, is going to reveal itself that the sea will split open, there'll be a revelation. That is going to happen when Mashiach comes. And we're working towards that. Every time we do a mitzvah, we bring another little bit of light, a little bit of godliness uh, into the world. Every time we refrain from one of the prohibitions of the Torah, we, we cut off any un impure uh, connections, what in uh, Kabbalah is called Kalippa. Uh, well, this world is, is, is totally under the grasp of that calipper, which is, uh, you know, absence of Hashem, impurity uh, that causes that denial. And, 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 and that's how the world sustains itself on God denial. Every time we fulfill one of the 365 uh, negative mitzvot, refrain from those prohibitions, we kind of cut off and it can't do it for that calipper to have any connection uh, to this world. And the way enough of us have done this for enough time, we have the new reality. We have Mashiach. So when was this process fast-tracked? Um, the last few hundred years have been the ikvata, uh, the Mashiach, the, 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 uh, the heel of Mashiach, where you can hear the footsteps of Mashiach you know, approaching his, his donkey, uh, I don't think donkeys gallop, but trot um, closer and closer um, towards us. Um, 
And with the beginning of the Hasidic movement with Baal Shem Tov and accelerated with uh, the first Chabad Rebbe, Shneazam of Liadi, this, this final process um, of making this world really a home for God, an ostensible home for God, rather than just a potential home for God, that process was accelerated. Um, it's a seven generation, seven step process, just like the initial process of the potential of the uh, giving, of the ter- giving us the tools to do it and the mandate to do it and the marching orders to do it. Now we get to actual final stages um, of making that world Mashiach ready. And that's been the past seven generations. And so when the previous server before his passing gave over that, that uh, document, it was, it's a specific discourse, um, where he laid out, he spoke about the seventh generations and the seventh generation, which was most, most precious, that the generation that would follow him with the seventh Rebbe, his son-in-law, his successor, um, that would do that final stage, just like Moshe Rabbeinu, brought um, from first heaven down to earth. Likewise, uh, it is the challenge of our generation uh, to, to just bring Mashiach across the threshold into this world and to, to make that three ceased but wide open. Significantly, when uh, the Rebbe of this generation, uh, Menachem Mendel, uh, leader of, 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 of this final generation of, of Chassidim, um, as we pray and hope, took over formerly the, the leadership of the, of the Hasidim. Those were his words. Bati Lagani, I've come to my garden. And he elaborated on that theme uh, of what it means um, that seven generations work towards bringing um, God in his home. So God created this world. He created the ability for denial and then gave us the mandate and said, do what you have to as the Jewish people to spread that divine light in the world. So that ultimately, in the world that shouts, there is no God, there will be a God. He'll be visible and it'll be, as we say in Aleinu, three times every single day, there'll be a new reality of godliness, obvious, clearly visible and experienced by all um, in this world. Please, God, uh, may that come very soon. Thank you.